Welcome back to our final morning session. At this time we have John Dalton speaking about a great escape. He's going tunnelling. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> I'm here all week. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm John Dalton. I'm a local. I work uh, remotely from my home office uh, here as a database administrator for a company called Engine Yard. I've been doing that um, about four years, but I've been a sysadmin, I guess, for too long now. I still think of myself as a sysadmin, you know. Anyway, so uh, I guess other than what I'm going to talk about today, um, you know, I have other interests. I didn't get to do my lightning talk on my other interests simply because I didn't put my name down. I probably would have done cake decorating. That's, that's one of my sort of weird little passions. And in fact, um, I have used Inkscape before for cake decorating. So it could even have been relevant here. <laughs> so other than that, uh, photography, spending too much money on dead tree books um, and four little boys that occupies all of my time. But uh, today I'm here to talk about SSH, uh, which as everybody knows stands for Secure Shell. It's that thing you use when you want to open a terminal session on another box somewhere. And most people probably never do anything much more complicated than that with it. Um, SSH is, of course, much more than just a remote terminal program. Um, it's a protocol for establishing a secure connection between two computers. And that connection can contain multiple channels, um, independent streams of data that are all encapsulated within that one connection. I'm going to talk about some of the cool things that you can do with those extra channels that SSH will bundle up for you. But first, let's start with the basics. So when you connect to a server via SSH, um, it's very similar to connecting to a secure website via HTTPS, right? First of all, you do your TCP handshake, so your, your three-way handshake happens. Then there's a... Um, we, we should have waited a couple of minutes. <laughs> so then there's a, uh, a key exchange um, to establish an encrypted connection. And a lot of people think that that's when your SSH private key is involved. There's actually an exchange that happens before that. So that's your private key stuff is, is part of the authentication, which is the next step, which is why if you, you can actually enter a password when you're connecting via SSH, of course, nobody does that anymore, right? Do they? <laughs> nobody actually types their password when they're connecting to a server, I hope. But um, I mean, you type your passphrase. We've all got passphrases on our keys, of course. But uh, yeah, so that authentication happens after the connection um, is already encrypted. Um, and as I mentioned, so there can be an, an extra sort of key exchange going on there for that. But usually what happens next is that the server starts a login shell process for you, uh, connects the standard input and output of that process to your terminal over the encrypted connection. So now your terminal looks like it's the other machine on the other room, other side of your desk, other side of the world, whatever. You don't need to open an interactive shell, of course. You can run a command directly um, on the remote system. And like all good Unix utilities, SSH plays really well with pipes. So piping another command's output through SSH is the simplest form of a tunnel. Um, here, the example I'm giving is um, I'm running a MySQL dump, so a database dump. Um, I'm piping that through gzip on my local machine. I'm going to compress that plain text SQL output. I'm going to compress it using gzip. And then I'm piping that compressed file um, out through my standard out to an SSH command, which connects to the other machine um, where I run cat and I output that to a file locally. So my standard out from gzip is now on another machine where it's connected to the standard in of the cat process. Um, 
I'm not sure if this counts as a useless use of cat or not, but <laughs> it does. Excellent. No? Yes? It, ex Sorry? Directly. So if I, if I don't have the cat there and I just start with a redirect symbol, that'll work? This is the way I'm used to doing it anyway. But, um, right, so what's happened here is that my standard out of, I, I had two local processes and then all of a sudden the other end of the pipe is somewhere else. Um, in this case, cat, yeah, is just there to receive the input coming in, something to do standard in, standard out. And of course, I can do it the other way around, right? I can run the SSH command first, um, and then I can do the dump and the compress on the remote host, and then pipe the output of my SSH command, which at this point is not a text terminal-based anything. It's, it's the raw gzip data, which I'm redirecting to a local file. So there, that's um, the pipe is inside those quotes. So that SSH command is that whole single quoted string there, um, a pipeline. And um, the local bit could be anything else, right? I can pipe that uh, as I would with any other command. I can grep the output of stuff. I'm probably not going to get much useful if I'm grepping the output of a gzip file. But you know, I could actually, for example, pipe it to zcat or zgrep um, if I don't want to. I mean, if I'm looking for something, um, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to do that. So it's a silly example, right? But the point is anything. It doesn't need to be textual, textual data, right? So that's handy. Um, it's kind of sort of a tunnel, right, in that you're extending your pipes across the network through an encrypted connection. Usually when people think of SSH tunnels, they're thinking of tunneling more than just the output of Unix commands. SSH can listen for incoming connections on a port that you specify and then forward any traffic that comes into that port through your encrypted connection to another host and port that you specify on the other end. And it can do this in either direction. Um, you can either listen for traffic on your local machine and forward that to the other end, or you can listen for traffic on the remote machine and forward that back to you. So let's, let's look at an example of uh, how that works. Here on a remote network behind a firewall, I have a server which is running some important internal service. The service is listening uh, for incoming connections on port 54321. Um, only servers on the same local network can connect to this. All right, it's, it's not exposed via the firewall or anything like that. And I need to connect to that service to configure some changes. The service is running here, doesn't support SSL. Nobody's going to open a hole in the firewall for me. Um, I can tell my local machine to connect uh, via SSH to that server and then to forward all traffic from port 54321 on my machine to the same port on that remote machine. And this is what that looks like. So now, when I access port 54321 on localhost, and here is my actual laptop. This can be any local machine that you're running SSH on. My request is sent transparently through the tunnel until it pops out onto the other side, where it appears to have come from the remote machine itself. It's important to remember here that there's no magic difference between a client and a server. A client is the thing that's making the request. A server is the thing that's receiving it. In any modern computing environment, most machines are being both clients and servers at the same time. So here, SSH on my local machine is acting as both a client and a server. It's an SSH client making a connection to a remote SSH server, but it's also listening on port 54321 for connections from local clients. So from the perspective of those clients, they're connecting to a server running on localhost. And SSH is a thing which has bound that port and is listening. On the other end, the SSH daemon is acting as a server for my SSH connection. But now it's also acting as a client. When traffic comes in on that forwarded port, it's opening a connection to the specified address and sending everything through. The service that I'm connecting to on the other end doesn't see a connection from my local machine. 
it sees a connection coming from the SSH process. So if I'm connecting, it, as in this example, to something running on localhost, it sees a local process connecting to a service running on that port on localhost. My browser doesn't see the IP address of the server that's actually provided the responses that are coming in over the tunnel, assuming here that the thing I'm accessing was a browser, whatever client I'm using. So as far as both ends of that tunnel are concerned, this is all local traffic. It's completely transparent to the clients. Um, SSH doesn't have to connect to localhost on the other end either. Um, perhaps our firewall only allows us to connect to one host via SSH. That's actually not too uncommon. Um, and it's not a problem because we can connect our forwarded port from that host to another host. So here we're connecting from our local machine. Oh, we, we're connecting our client, right? For example, the same client that we ran before, we're connecting to port 54321 on localhost. Um, that is going over an SSH connection to the same remote machine, but then when it reaches the other end, SSH is making a connection not to itself, but to a third machine inside that remote network. So you can see here, even though my local machine doesn't have any idea what that private IP address, the 10.1.1.7, no idea what that means, no possible route to access that. I'm not accessing that locally. This is something that will happen at the far end of the tunnel. When I get to the other end of the tunnel, I will then make a connection to that IP address on that port. And so as you can see, the port doesn't even need to be the same, which comes in useful if you need to talk to multiple services or services that might be running on ports that you're already mapping locally. So we can tell SSH to even allow other hosts to connect to the forwarded port using the gateway ports setting. Normally SSH is only going to allow connections from our local machine. So wherever we make this connection, that's the only place that you'll be able to connect to that port. But if we turn on the gateway ports option, SSH will actually bind that to um, all, all interfaces. It's probably configurable which interfaces. Um, and then allow other hosts to connect to the port on the local machine and forward those as well. So you can have a situation where, for example, uh, this what looks like my laptop here um, might be a machine running on a local network that appears to be running, for example, a web server. Other machines in the network can connect to that web server, which isn't really there. It's at the other end of an SSH tunnel. There's no way for those local clients to know that. A remote tunnel works um, in basically in the same way, but it happens in reverse. When we open our connection to the remote machine, we tell the far end to listen for traffic on that specified port um, and then to send that traffic back across the tunnel to us. So this time we're imagining that we're running a service that's listening on port 3000 on our local machine. It's, let's say I'm developing something on my laptop um, and I want to make the development version of this service that I'm working on available to something in a remote network. Um, we can connect to the remote machine uh, via SSH. It can't connect to us. You know, we're a laptop sitting in a cafe somewhere on a natted broadband connection. But we can ask SSH to listen to port 3000 on the far end of that connection once we get there um, and then make a connection from our local machine to the service running on port 3000 on localhost. So any traffic that's received on 3000 on the remote end is forwarded back through the tunnel and passed on to the service listening on port 3000 on localhost. Um, we can actually do both of these things at the same time. Um, so here I have a local port forwarded to the remote end and a remote port forwarded back to me. Not only can you use both local and remote port forwarding at the same time, you can specify each of those arguments multiple times. So we could instead forward multiple local ports and so on. And people get, people get these options confused a lot of the time. Um, they're sometimes confused about 
which one to use and, and what all of these different scary things inside colons mean. And the only difference is that in both cases, SSH will bind to a port, listen for connections, and then pass them on to the host and port that you specify. The L means that the port it binds to is local, and the R means that the port it binds to is remote. Otherwise, the arguments mean the same thing. It's always going to bind to the first port, um, and then it's going to connect to the host and port that come after that. So if you're using the local option, then the host and port need to be on the far end of the tunnel, and vice versa. If you use the remote option, then the connection will happen from your machine. All right, so there are other types of tunnels that SSH can actually set up for you automatically without having to go to that level of detail. So first, um, let's paint another picture, although this one was actually drawn. All right, you have SSH access to both server A and B here. On server A is a really big file. Let's say it's a you know multi gigabytes of database dump or something like that. Um, and you need to transfer that file across to server B. You don't want to download it locally first because that's going to take forever. You're on a slow connection somewhere. And these machines have a pretty fast connection between themselves. Maybe they're in the same data center, maybe not. But whatever it is, it would be much faster if you could just move it directly from A to B without coming down to you first. Um, when you connect to server A, and try to SCP that file across to B, it doesn't work because you don't have your private key on server A, do you, right? <laughs> you don't want to have your private key on server A. Um, maybe that's because you don't want to put it anywhere. You absolutely don't have to. But let's pretend that that's a shared server that somebody else has root on. So you wouldn't consider that a safe place to put your private key. Now, you could generate a new key pair just for this purpose. Put that key pair on server A, add it to the authorised keys list on server B. And if this is the kind of thing that you actually need to do regularly, that makes sense. It's, um, it's a good solution for a regular task or especially if you're trying to automate this kind of copy. Right? But for one-self tasks like I need to copy file from A to B, um, it would be really nice if you could just take advantage of the fact that both servers already trust the key pair that you normally use. Um, this is such a common use case that SSH will automate that for you with one argument. You provide the dash A argument, which sets up forwarding for the authentication agent. And when you use this option uh, while connecting to a remote system, SSH creates a socket file on the remote end uh, and sets up an environment variable to tell subsequent SSH processes where to go looking for it. And when you run SSH on the remote machine, it sees that there's an authentication agent available, um, and it tries to talk to that through the socket file, which is transparently forwarded back through the tunnel to your local machine, to the local agent running on your machine. That does any key operations that are required um, and sends the results back. So your private key doesn't travel across the wire, it's never sat on the remote system. Um, it's never left your machine. This approach is not foolproof. Um, a hostile root user, again, on the remote system can access that socket file. So therefore, they can talk to your authentication agent. Um, it's probably non-trivial for them to do anything useful by doing that, but it does mean that it's possible for them to authenticate as you um, using any of the keys available in your agent. Still, that's a, a much smaller and more manageable risk than actually putting your key somewhere where it may be potentially exposed. Does anyone still use X11? Yes, lots of people. It's, it's these weird Mac user kind of people and I don't know. It's, it's been a while for me, but um, if you have an X desktop uh, and you want to run a GUI app on a remote machine that's connecting back to your local display, uh, you don't like 
open holes in firewalls and set display variables manually and do horrible things like that. SSH can tunnel all of that for you automatically. Um, there's a dash X and also a dash Y option, which have different sort of security semantics. And it'll automatically create a tunnel between the two machines. It will set the display variable remotely, um, appropriately, so that any X clients on the far end uh, will communicate with an X server over the tunnel. Um, it's been a while. I'm trying to think exactly how long. We're probably talking like 10 years since I've actually had to do this myself. Um, it's not a lot of fun to do over a WAN link. Right? <laughs> X was never really intended for that kind of thing. And there are lots of hacks to make it slightly less head-bangingly painful. But um, you know, it, this has come in useful to me in the past, uh, so I mentioned it here. And there are legitimate reasons why you might need to do that kind of thing. For example, if the remote machine is completely different architecture, operating system, everything, and there's some proprietary horrible X client that you need to use to configure some horrible proprietary service. Um, you can just run an X display and, and get it on your own local machine, no matter what you're running, as long as it talks X. All right, so these kinds of tunnels are all extremely useful. Uh, they tend to be used for very specific purposes, like accessing a particular service behind a firewall, securing communications between two systems that need to communicate across the internet, uh, but don't have any built-in support for encryption, like SSL or anything like that. Um, and unless you're using one of the tunnels that SSH has built-in support for, uh, setting one up requires knowing in advance exactly which ports you need to forward to which host on the other end and in what direction. There's another standard for forwarding connections from a client to remote servers that allows the client to specify dynamically which host and port it wants to connect to. And this saves you from setting up any port forwarding in advance, um, has the downside that the client actually has to understand how to negotiate the host and port details every time it opens a connection. So setting this up with SSH is very, very simple. You can tell SSH you want it to act as a SOX proxy server and which port it should listen on. Then you tell your local, local applications to use a SOX proxy on that port and SSH handles the rest. When your local clients make a connection, they need to negotiate with the SOX proxy and say, I want to connect to host X on port Y. Um, SSH tunnels that request to the far end where it then opens a connection from the remote end of the tunnel dynamically to the host and port that the client specified. And it has the effect of making all traffic from the local ap application appear to originate from the far end of the tunnel, from wherever you connected to via SSH. Um, this is an example of configuring on a Mac, because I'm on a Mac. Um, it's, it's gonna be standard sort of network settings, um, or you can set it via environment variables, depending on the application that you're using. So for this to work, you need to know uh, that your application has SOC support, but of course a, a web browser is a common example of something that supports the SOC protocol. Um, this is really useful if your local machine can't make outgoing HTTP connections, for example, or can't connect to some specific host from its current location. Uh, you might be behind some kind of some kind of uh, captive portal type thing that, for some strange reason, allows SSH but makes all of your web connections go to some horrible landing page happens that they allow SSH. Um, it can also be used to circumvent some types of geo-blocking um, or as a way to make web, web traffic originate from a system that you trust rather than pass through an unfriendly network. You might need to access things that are not over SSL um, on a public network or some kind of generally unfriendly network. And there are all kinds of legitimate reasons why people who are not criminals or terrorists, might need to do this. 
I mean, in many parts of the world, people's um, interests, political views, gender, sexual orientation, any number of other factors can put them at risk of harm. And a right to privacy goes hand in hand with a right to safety and self-determination. Of course, this isn't the kind of thing we need to worry about here in peaceful, democratic countries like Australia. I'm talking about totalitarian regimes that restrict free speech, freedom of assembly, that kind of thing. But uh, in all seriousness, SSH is not the best tool for securing all of your communications in order to guarantee privacy, but it's a tool that is already available or very easily installed, um, which is important for people who may not control the computers that they use to get online. For example, even on a Windows machine, um, Putty will run out of whatever folder you've got it in usually. That's probably not true if you have a competent Windows admin who's really restricted what you can run, but there aren't huge numbers of those. So it's possible to get SSH to establish um, an actual VPN. And this statement comes with two caveats. The first is that this isn't necessarily a good idea. Um, the second is that there's a lot of confusion about what VPN means. So VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and it means that devices which are connected to a VPN act as though they are actually on the same network. Applications don't need to know anything about it uh, because they connect to other devices on the network as though they're on the same LAN. Um, a virtual private network means a network interface, not just forwarding some ports. And the term has become confused probably because of the popularity of various services at the moment uh, which let you bypass geo-blocking in order to watch US Netflix, that kind of thing. Um, some of those are VPNs, some of them are proxies. I mean, it's a pedantic kind of distinction to make as far as a, a lot of end users are concerned, but it, it does, does matter. So SSH supports creating a VPN, and it'll only handle part of the job for you. The W option to SSH will create a point-to-point -point tunnel network device on both the local and remote machines, um, and we'll connect them together. Um, unfortunately, to do this, you need root privileges on both ends. Uh, you need to configure those network interfaces so that they actually route traffic between the two networks. All of that's left uh, up to you. SSH cannot automate that part. Um, there's a decent guide on the Ubuntu wiki which describes some of the steps involved in setting this up. Of course, you know, they're Debian, Ubuntu sort of specific as far as the network config stuff is concerned. But uh, for the most part, it, it goes into decent detail. I've stolen this diagram from that page. So <clears throat> they obviously didn't even have pencils available, war guys. In this diagram, we can see um, machine A and machine B up the top on the left and right, and their networks, their local networks are represented by those boxes on the bottom. In the middle is the internet, the unsafe Wild West network that we need our traffic to travel through. And then SSH creates network devices on machine A and machine B and allows traffic to tunnel between those. Uh, we need to actually know the details of what is our IP address range on our network, what route do we need in order to access the remote network versus the local network, where is our gateway? Are we still using our local network as the gateway for other traffic, or are we um, now setting our gateway to be some machine on the remote network, which we now have a route to? So you actually need to understand a little bit of networking to get all of this to work. Um, it's a sufficient amount of mucking around that if you really need this kind of solution, you probably ought to consider using actual VPN software to make it happen. Um, if you're just looking for a simpler option for those once-off sort of use cases where a VPN would be really handy but a real VPN would be overkill to set up, um, I recommend checking out SSH Shuttle. Shuttle, a project whose name was never meant to be said out loud 
obviously. This is not a true VPN, but it does a very good job of faking it using a combination of transparent proxying and clever firewall rules on the client side. Um, importantly, this doesn't require root privileges on the far end of the connection or any setup of network interfaces, routes, that kind of thing. I'm on a Mac, um, I use Homebrew, so all I had to do to install this is run brew install shuttle. Um, it's probably already packaged for your distro. Um, it shouldn't be too hard to install by hand if necessary. Um, once I've got it installed, I can run the shuttle command like so. So I do need root privileges locally to adjust my local firewall, um, but not on the far end. Here you can see I'm connecting as an unprivileged user. So this example says to connect as me at some host to proxy local DNS requests to the other side because there are some services that use DNS resolution um, to determine where, where you are. You get different answers to that request even from what looks to be the same IP depending on where you made the request from. Um, so in this case, I'm making sure that my DNS requests actually originate from the other end of the tunnel. I uh, capture and forward for this example all traffic for all networks, that's what the zero slash zero means, but I could instead have specified that I only wanted to capture traffic for particular networks and specify the address range, subnet mask, that kind of thing there. Um, and then the, the capital D tells me that, um, or tells shuttle that I want it to demonize. So I run this command, it says connected, I get my prompt back, and now, um, once it's running, I can connect to any machine on the remote network as though I was on the same network using internal IP addresses uh, from my laptop and so on. If you're doing something exotic, you might find that it doesn't behave exactly the same as being on the local network. Um, so it might not be sufficiently VPN-ish, but for most use cases, you probably won't be able to tell the difference. So what's the takeaway from all of this. Some of what we looked at is stuff that maybe you shouldn't be doing with SSH. I don't want anyone to go home and decide that from now on all VPNs will be implemented using SSH. Um, but the truth is that SSH is a far more capable tool than most regular users are aware. It's, uh, it's more of a multi-tool than a hammer. But even if all you have is a hammer, sometimes it's more productive to bash something into shape than to drive to the hardware store. Knowing how to use our tools gives us uh, flexibility and sometimes even knowing that something is possible is enough to help when you're deciding how to approach a problem. And hopefully you've learned something new about SSH today, but if you didn't, hopefully you can come up and teach me something instead. That's all I've got for now, so if there are any questions, go for it. Any questions on SSH or maybe VPNs? Yes, we have one. Julius. Yep. Uh, so the environment I work in often is restricted by firewalls and things, and sometimes it's a matter of tunnelling here and tunnelling there, and I've got multiple tunnels going. Yep. Um, do you know of a nice, easy way to manage those potentially in a graphical tool so I don't actually have to um, keep all these sessions running in a separate tab and know which one was to which machine? Um, you can't, so as, as for a graphical tool for setting that up, I'm not sure. Are, are you on, what's your client? OS X. Right, okay. So um, on OS X, you're just using standard open SSH. Yeah. Um, you can use the config file in your .ssh directory. So what you want to do is specify host blocks in that config file, and then any of the client variables, which you can find, I think it's man ssh underscore config, I think, as opposed to ssh d underscore config <laughs> for the client options. But you can specify all of these things, all the command line options that you would use, you can specify in a client config file. So when you then say SSH to some host, SSH looks at your local config file, finds a block for what to do when connecting to that host, 
um, and we'll set it all up for you automatically. Sure. And you can then have an alias or a script, for example, if you need to specify, if you need to connect to multiple hosts and establish multiple tunnels with each, you can just fire off a bunch of SSH connections yeah, in so one. That's, that's basically what I've got. I've got a heap of bash aliases that do yep. all those things for me. Right. The issue is if I've got six or seven of them running, I'm not sure if I need to invoke the eighth or if I might already have it running already. Cause it, right. Yeah, it's right. just when you start stacking them around, it gets so in that case, to track. In that case, you would treat that as a service like any other. So you'd create um, some kind of monitoring config, yeah. you know, monitor or God or an init script that watches, yep. <laughs> you know. So you treat it like any service because it is now a service. It's part of your persistent network config. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Cheers. Um, and one way to answer, one way to solve that is use connection reusing in SSH, uh, so that when you um, SSH to a new a, a host, a new host, it will set up a new socket, and when you connect to the same host in a different SSH, it will find the existing socket and just tunnel through the same thing, rather than setting up set, set up a separate SSH tunnel. Uh, so that's so that's by establishing a new channel in an existing connection. Yep. You've just taught me something new. Yep. I Wonderful. think it's called reuse connection. Okay. Um, and then you supply a particular file uh, template which gives it what. Um, Do you need to tell that when you when you set up it's the in first the, it's SSH, in the SSH connection? SSH it config. Listen. So yep. that's that's in your SSH config. But as soon as that's in your SSH config, then uh, all your future SSH connections will try to use that and there is an op, a dash O option to disable that if for some reason one of your connections, that connection is stalled and now you need a new SSH yep. connection to, connect, to get in and unstall it. So <laughs> what okay. I was going to ask was, um, you know, sometimes there are, you know, firewalls block port 22 right. destinations, um, but they leave things like uh, HTTP and HTTPS open. Do you feel there's any harm in having a home server with a listening a SSH listening on port 443 and that sort of thing? I personally don't feel there's any harm on doing something like that. Um, it, it's possible, depending on what kind of blocking they're doing, um, if they're trying to do some kind of stateful inspection and you're doing something on port 443 that doesn't look like the beginning of an SSL connection, that might not work. But there's nothing wholly about those assigned port numbers as far as I'm concerned. And if it's a machine that you control on the other end, put whatever service you want on whatever port. And if people get upset, that's their problem. Yeah. So <laughs> no, that's a useful technique. SSH can listen on a different port if port 22 is blocked. There's also a tool called SSLH, which multiplexes. So if you connect to port 443 with an SSH client, you get SSH. If you go to it in a web browser, you get web right um, excellent there's so you'd run that then as a server on on port 443 on on the port server, 43 and, and it will dynamically connect the client to whichever is the Correct. appropriate service Correct. yep that's um, very handy there's also console tools like tsox soxify there's probably others that let your non-SOX clients work with the SOX servers, so you yes. might not need the VPN in some cases yes no so that's true so it is true that the application needs to know how to use SOX for a SOX proxy approach to work, but it's also true that you can use a proxy to provide that, that smarts. Yeah. Yep. And there is one more type of tunneling that I'm aware of, which is uh, added in a fairly recent release that basically integrates something you used to be able to do with NetCat abuse um, to bounce SSH sessions through multiple machines in a nice, easy manner. Right. Okay. Cool. Are we any other questions? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's Paul. Here's your memento of the occasion. <laughs>